So in 2003, France's Tor Supra Tokamak broke the world record for longest sustaining plasma by going for six and a half minutes. Then in 2016, South Korea's superconducting tokamak set a new record for maintaining the highest temperature plasma at temperatures of 50 million degrees Celsius for 70 seconds. But then China's East Reactor came along and broke the temperature record by over two times the temperature by maintaining 119 million degrees Celsius for 102 seconds. And now now, that same reactor has also broken the duration record running in early 2022 for a duration of 17 minutes with a temperature of 70 million degrees Celsius. Now, for reference, the core of our sun is a mere 15 million degrees Celsius, so this is five times hotter than the sun, which is why it's being called China's artificial sun. And no, they didn't launch it into space. So what did they change to the reactor to beat all these records, and how the hell are they containing all this heat? So fusion works by using lasers to heat up deteriorating and tritium, which are isotopes of hydrogen to superheated temperatures. This causes them to smash together and fuse into helium and other byproducts while releasing heat. Then, of course, the goal is to capture that heat and use it to boil steam. It all really just comes back to boiling water, doesn't it? Anyways, this reaction creates the plasma that needs to be contained, and China's reactor does this by using superconducting toroidal and poloidal magnets, so essentially magnetic confinement. This works because the plasma consists of charged particles, positive nuclei, and negative negative electrons, and by using magnetic forces, you can shape and confine the plasma. And the magnets are superconducting for two reasons. The first is that just by being a superconducting material inherently means that it produces a magnetic field. This is called the Meissner effect, which is why you always see these superconductors floating. And the second is that by being superconducting, it uses significantly less energy than traditional magnetic fields. And so this is how it can contain temperatures larger than the sun. It's not like those massive temperatures are touching the walls because the magnets are confining it, and there is a temperature gradient while the heat is being taken in by other methods. Now what's unique about China's reactor is that it's also the first reactor to test superconducting niobium titanium poloidal field magnets. And this makes it the first tokamak with both superconducting toroidal and poloidal magnets. Now toroidal means that it's a magnetic field going around the torus or the central void. And poloidal means that it's the magnetic field going around the surface. Now it's kind of annoyingly like unclear why this is the first time this has been done. But as far as I can tell, Tokamaks do typically use magnets for both of these directions, but I think this is just the first time that they are both superconducting. Now, in my opinion, one of the main bottlenecks for fusion is that these superconductors are only superconducting at super cooled temperatures, which means researchers must put significant energy into keeping them cool, which reduces the total output of the reactor. This is actually one of the reasons why I invested in a startup looking to build room temperature or even higher temperature superconductors. This would be a massive breakthrough, and I think I might make a video on them soon, but my friend from Teal Cap Jesse Mickles just posted a video with the founder if you also want to check that out. Anyways, for this reactor, their next step seems to be to test the reactor at higher temperatures and to contain it for similar lengths of time. Now, this will get them closer and closer to achieving a higher triple product, which measures the density of the plasma, the temperature of the ions, and the energy confinement time. And figuring out how to do this will bring us closer to what ITER is trying to achieve, which is where fusion hopefully becomes viable. And so that's why China built this reactor in the first place, to contribute to ITER's progress after they joined ITER and to advance their own fusion goals, which includes mass manufacturing fusion plants by 2060. And considering that just one liter of ocean water can output as much energy in a fusion reactor as over 300 gallons of gasoline, the future is going to be really interesting once we solve fusion. But that's a topic for another time. Also, so I know this was about ITER, but I don't actually think they're going to be the main way that we produce fusion. I'm actually more bullish on startups commercializing the research that ITER is doing and then creating fusion that way. Also, so when do you guys think that we'll have fusion? Like, let me know in the comments. I think we might have it within this decade. I mean, that would be insane. Okay, lastly, I know this was a different type of video than usual. So let me know what you thought of this. Let me know if there's other topics that you want me to cover and make sure to go check out Deep and Jesse's video, it was awesome. But otherwise, Nasjak out. I'll see you guys in the next one. Helicopter, helicopter.